My name is Michelle Carilla Fillmore. I am the gallery director and curator for the Huntley Gallery and for the Kellogg Art Gallery across the way, uh, which will, my, I need to talk a little louder, okay. Um, and uh, the uh, gallery across the way is the Kellogg Art Gallery, and uh, it will be open till five o'clock also if you'd like to uh, get over there before it closes um, after we're done here. Um, I want to introduce uh, the artist of the day, John David O'Brien. Um, and welcome to this show, uh, John David O'Brien's O Bibliology, A Personal History of Books as Physical Objects. Uh, this was a really fun title, I think, that uh, you came up with. No, no, you added the O apostrophe. <laughs> I had bibliology. She said, what about O Bibliology? Like, Okay, that's good. Uh, I'll own because it. it makes it all about all you, all about you. Um, so the study of books—that's what uh, I learned from John about uh, what a bibliology is—is is the study of books, which he is a master of. Um, and so yes, we added the O for to make it unique uh, because it is about books that he has collaborated in, um, artwork that has emanated, come from those books. Um, from the creation of those books, um, as well as books that uh, an artist collects. Um, the books that are on display here are uh, books that have influenced him or that he's uh, just loved and, and made his own um, uh, through uh, friendships and, and collaborations with other artists that uh, uh, he knows in Italy. Um, you will see many books uh, on display that are uh, made by other Italian bookmakers that he is introducing to you as part of his collection. Um, so uh, the reason why I really wanted to do this show was because, well, one, uh, you know, John's just a wonderful person to work with. Um, he's also, for those of you who don't know, also a uh, art writer or slash critic, what some might might say is a critic, um, although we like to say reviewer yeah, these days. Just art writer. Art, art writer, writer. Arts writer. Arts writer. Um, and curator. Um, and uh, also an artist. Uh, you know, a lot of times curators can be artists too. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the, the passion comes from deep within. Um, so uh, the reason why I wanted to do it, this show, and in particular in the library, was because it's book-based. I think it's a good place for that, uh, for showing book art. Um, and it's also an opportunity, uh, we have a very strong graphic design program here at the university, um, and the students um, who have already started attending the show during this week when we opened earlier this week, um, uh, they, the students are required as part of their, their uh, the program to create uh, books, um, not just creating, a lot of times people think graphic designers are just working on computers and creating graphics on the computers, but no, they have to t take printmaking, they have to learn hands-on experience making, making prints, um, and the different, the different types of printmaking, engraving, aquatint, uh, lithograph, and so on. Um, they also have to learn uh, typesetting, they have to learn uh, how to uh, do book layouts, uh, and they even make handmade books. Um, there are book art classes that we teach here at Cal Poly. So I thought that this would really be an opportunity for students to really see all sides of what it is to the, in the creative process of making a book that is art. Um, to speak no further, because I don't think you, want to, you came to hear me, um, I would like for John to talk a bit about um, his work, um, about his experiences working in Italy with other artists, um, what's drawn you to, to do what you do. Um, I think that's... And then I'll ask them questions. Yeah. Or, or you can ask me questions. Or you can ask us questions. And I'll give you the microphone. <laughs> answer my questions. It would help me a lot. OK. Thank you so much. And we do have, I, I actually have a few questions I can okay. throw at you, too. So did that get clipped on yeah, now? Yeah, you can clip it on. So can you hear me? Yeah. It's good? Yeah. Well, normally when I talk about my artist books, I don't. Um, people know me more for my sculpture, for my art writing, and for my curating. But actually, I started as a printmaker, and I started in a very peculiar and particular and interesting school in Urbino. And although there's a really interesting but way too long a story of how I ended up in Urbino, suffice to say that I was at a place that was then called Istituto d'Arte d'Urbino, which means Art Institute of Urbino, but it was subtitled La Scuola del Libro, which translates as the School of the Book. It was an institute of art that had been put together in post-World War II and just prior to World War II as well, in which artists were taught how to do everything that was book-related. 
There was illustration, there was book binding, there was paper making, there was print making. I ended up specializing in etching and engraving, but I actually learned and gained an enormous amount of love from the books that were there at Urbino that we were developing together. The school did not develop that many books as an institute. We all did our individual practices. And then when I got out of the school, I went to Rome and I got specialized in the Accademia di Belle Arti, more in painting, more in drawing, more in large scale installations, but I never lost my love of bookmaking. And in fact, among the first projects I ever made were collaborations with poets. Because I was always fascinated. I mean, I thought that artists were crazy. We do all this stuff and it's rarely ever sold and we dedicate lots of time and energy and money and love. But poets, wow, I mean, they do even more. And they can't even have an object at the end. Sometimes it's a book or, or just a piece of paper. So I thought, OK, they're as crazy as we are in a really good way. And so I wanted to collaborate with them. And what I would do is I'd institute a kind of give and take. I would either take a group of poems that they would give me, select some that I felt I could make images relational to them, give them back those, and then they could pick out from the drawings that I made the ones that they thought worked well within my book. And that practice has subterraneanly continued with throughout my life ever since. When I came to Los Angeles and my degrees from Italy were zeroed out, I had to go back and get an American MFA, which was fine, but I did it in sculpture. So I didn't really tell people that I was a printmaker. I taught it, but I didn't bring that practice back with me for many years. And I certainly wasn't interested in having too many hats for people to recognize me, so I didn't pull it out that often. But I continue to do collaborative projects, and there are a number of them around here that we can talk about in a second. And then in the center is a very small selection of artist books from people who are peers, often people like Lydia Predominato, who I worked with for years, collaborating on doing artist organized exhibitions, doing writing projects, or Guido Strazzo, who's now in his 90s, who was my mentor. And when I got my degree from the Academia di Belle Arti, he said, well, it's great that you have this diploma, but it's just a piece of paper. Here's your real diploma. And he gave me this artist book. So these are the kinds of things that I wanted to put together, because for me, the arts, especially the visual arts, but maybe all arts, are a community effort. As much as the market needs single individuals and their objects, the truth of the art world is that we're all in it together. We're working together. And whether it be with music, whether it be with design, whether it be with poetry or with visual arts, this is a community. And I wanted something to underscore that in most of my practices, which I've been trying to do for quite some time. So these are friends and peers. It is a very small swath of things that I thought would also be technically different from one another, so that someone coming here that might be students would be able to see that. But I have a much larger group of people that I'm beholden to, that I'm grateful for, and that I've worked with over the years. So this is just part of it. But if you look around the walls, you'll see a book back there, which is called Verge. And it goes around here to these paintings. Verge is a project that was elaborated with Laura Mullen, who is a writer, and myself, and we put it together not so many years ago. It started with me telling her laughingly that I proposed a public artwork for this area in which I was really fascinated by the googies, which are those emblematic architectural devices that you see in the book. I told her the funny story was that I did it as a proposal, I won the public art commission, and I did it all, except the woman who was responsible for it came out and said, and you know, John, people out here hate those googies. Just lose them, get rid of them. The other part's fine, but you got to promise never to come back in here with googies. So I had these little googie models that I'd actually made in Umbria. I'd made them out of cardboard, and I was like, oh, they're really so beautiful. And it's true that most of the googies have been abandoned, with the exception of the theme building at LAX. So Laura and I talked about it. She said, well, I'd love to do some writing about the way in which Los Angeles went from being this oasis, this mirage in the desert, to now being a place that actually has an archaeological history. So that's how Verge came about. And it came about very much between the two of us. The blue on that paper is related to the windshields and windscreens that were in cars that used to have a band of darker blue above, lighter blue below. The googies are all photographs that I took or adapted graphically. And then the words are all from Laura's um, writing about the California, Southern California landscape. Because although she now functions as a poet in New Orleans, she teaches at the U ULA. So she's actually teaching in Baton Rouge. She lived in Southern California for many years. And then I did a series of works that are paintings based on other extrapolations about the Guggi era. So you'll find imagery of Sputnik Girl. You'll find imagery of things that are also typographical 
misnomers, ligatures that have gone wrong or symbols that are used just in the world of typography, and then I used them and had them printed, I used them. I, I had those images painted, printed on paper and then mounted on a aluminum substrate so I could turn them into paintings. Because I, I really think that migrating, for me, across the different practices is important. You'd have to go through this book to see it, but this is a collaboration between myself and Molly Bendel, an LA-based poet, and this one is called Incantation. And it follows exactly the same process that I was talking about last time, where I got from Molly a sheaf of poems from her most recent writing, of which I picked out 13, and then I did about 20 drawings, and she picked out 13 that she thought would work. So in this book, which I'm not supposed to touch, there are pages that are printed in letterpress, which is done by Gloria Condra. But there's, I'm not going to touch it. I got the gloves. I said you I know. <laughs> you know when you're an artist, it's your stuff. It's, I, don't, I didn't eat any brownies. I have no chocolate on my fingers. But just to show you, there are, pa there are pages in which prints have been put in the book. Yeah, that's going to disappear for a second. Prints have been put in the book on semi. Oh, that'd be great. Do you want to just, just flip the one? Pick up. Don't worry. It's fine. So there are pages that have prints that are meant to be seen through. You put, we put them on a semi-transparent piece of paper so you can see the print through to the, to the poetry. And that was something that Molly and I did together. We made the decisions together. So that was all. Thanks. But that, just to give you an idea. And then those are prints down there in which I was particularly working on gadzooks. Gadzooks are a term from typography. They're a ligature between letters that doesn't exist. And they're very common in German. You see them a lot, the double S's and the double F's. But I was fascinated by the way that these gadzooks had this word attached. Gadzook, which, gads, gadzooks. It actually is a, it's a typographical term, and it's an anomaly. So. These went from being prints in which I was using myself and modeling myself in photography against chiaroscuro woodprint, woodcuts from the 17th and 1800s, and then at the same time going and creating these new letter forms. So I'm not sure what you would like me to address, if anything at all, but that is kind of the introduction to what's here. I, I would like to state that I think that the span and bandwidth that is shown both in my work because it goes from episodes, from a sequence of one works, to a sequence of a different work, to a sequence of another's. I think that the stylistic discontinuity is amply compensated by the conceptual underlies that I'm interested in. The way the work works together, although it looks on the surface to be somewhat different. And I appreciate that you came to see this part of my secret life. This is my <laughs> hidden world of bookmaker and printmaker. I still do occasionally prints, although the problem with prints is you have to have a press, and that takes up a lot of realty in your studio. So this is what I do, and I'm working now on two new projects, two book projects, and I have one that I just did for an exhibition in Italy that didn't fit to this show, but I really decided I'm going to make books more a more visible part of my life, so that when the occasion comes, and I want to thank very much Michelle and the people who worked here, the students, they did an amazing job. I was not able to assist because I was busy installing another show, but they did an amazing job. And, and it's really wonderful to be able to share this kind of work and to have it so majestically curated so that people can see the things that I do. But I have others that are ongoing, so potentially in the future you may even see some more of the other things that I'm doing. And that was kind of what I thought I should say. But if anybody has a question and it's not too hard to answer. <laughs> Got one. A super simple one, actually. And that's on um, incantations. I was wondering if, um, after it was printed, if you went in, and I was looking how some find at the back of the, the, what would typically be the printed page, if that was an additional little print, or if you went back in with the hand and. They were all yeah. printed, Jonna. They were all printed in advance. And they were actually all laid out by us because um, Gloria Condra, who is the woman who, who types it and put this book together and did the amazing cover, she has a place that she run came Vero Press. So she did the exact thing you would do for a book. She did a mock-up, page by page. And the ones that are printed on both sides, the prints are printed on both sides, the only thing I can tell you is for every book that we have here, there were multiple prints that didn't line up. So <laughs> those were part, part of my garbage collection for quite some time. <laughs> Yes. 
Those are the actual lino cuts. Those are, those are print techniques that are done on linoleum. They're the lino cuts that are in the book. They are. I did, yes. These were put up by the curatorial crew and by Michelle because they thought it was kind of an interesting sort of vortex above the book, of the things that are in the book. These I didn't throw away by luck because you can see that I'm doing things with fragments of wood. It, 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 when, when you're printmaking and you're not setting yourself up as a university studio, whatever's around you get to use. So these are battleship linoleum. It's a linoleum that, that holds for a good time even if you're carving into it. It's mounted on plywood and no, the, that configuration was just suggested by them based on what was in the book with all the vortices that are floating around and there's cloud-like structures in the book. But these are literally the plates that were used in producing this book. No, there were scraps of wood that I just glued linoleum on. Got it. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I see. It was cobbled together in the most common artistic practices known as making do with what you got in the studio <laughs> that otherwise would end up in the junk bin. Let, let, me, let me interject a moment. So I had asked John if it was possible, if he had lino cuts available, um, being that... You stay where you're at. Um, being that, uh, you know, I noticed that he was using lino cut as a technique in printmaking, I thought it was really important to show that because, you know, the lino cut is really where the art making it happens. <laughs> you know, you're making those shapes and those forms in the material, which is then pressed onto the paper. I, a lot of times people don't understand the concept of how things are printed, <coughs> what printmaking is or how what's involved in it um you know you have to think backwards a lot of times when you want to print because or when you create the um the impression that is going to be printed you have to uh, think backwards because it's the opposite that's going to end up printed and a lot of people don't realize that if they've never print been a printmaker or done printmaking before so for me as an educational component of the show i wanted people students who visited uh, to see, or even faculty who brought students, to, to be able to show students, okay, this is a lino cut. This is what the artist cuts into, the material it's cut into, to get a certain effect to be able to use it for printmaking, um, and then in turn using it for books. Um, so it was really important for me to show that whenever possible. I mean, if you had had a zinc plate, I would have asked you to bring that in too. <laughs> but you know, I didn't show her the zinc plate. Yeah, he they're didn't the, show me they're that. In the back. <laughs> but didn't they're they're under other stuff, so it would have been. We, you know, we can we can approach that another time, another I guess. Time, sure. <laughs> um, but the the lino cuts, I think, is really important because I don't think people know that linoleum is used for other things as well, other than just for floors. So when you do an exhibition at a place like a university that has an art department, I'm always honored that they want to also look behind the scenes of the technique. It's true that for an art guy that's commercial, you wouldn't want to show the plates. You wouldn't want to show your friend's work. But that's the lovely, I think, wonderfulness of showcases like this. You can fulfill many different things. It shows my work. It shows some of the technique. It shows some of my friends who've done different techniques. So that, for me, friends and peers, is really one of the wonderful things that a, that a showcase at a university can do. And I wanted to take advantage of it. Any other questions? Yes, Francis. So what were you able to do in Italy, do you think, or what ideas did you encounter in Italy that you wouldn't have encountered here if you had had similar training only in the US? It's kind of hard now to sort of imagine what it would be like to have not been in Italy. It's sort of one of those things you're like, yeah, that would have been a really interesting split in the road. But the one thing that I've noticed over time was at the time in Italy, the school of the book was really a school for artisans. It wasn't primarily for artists, although everybody who was doing work was doing creative work. They weren't thinking, yeah, I'm going to go out and make books. They were thinking they'd work in the industry of making books. Some people ended up in cinema, some people ended up on television, some people ended up doing animation. But because it was artisanal training, I got a lot of training in things that most American schools don't give you. I know, for example, how to make inks from pigments and oils. I know how to mold them. I know how to make grounds for printmaking, which people normally just buy from the store. Because of that behind the scenes and technical aspects, I approach art not just as a tool, but also as sort of a self-wrought system that you can make up as you go. The other thing that I would say that maybe feeds into what your question is, is 
For the longest time, fine arts was one regime that had painting, sculpture, and that was about it. Then the other were minor arts. So there was drawing, and then there was printmaking, there was fiber arts, there was ceramics, and those were really all the outsiders. Well, I was always with the outsiders who really seemed cool. And the insiders were cool too, but it was like, you know, you don't have to do a large oil painting to make a significant artwork in the world. So there was also a little bit more focus on technique, which has now come to the fore. You see a lot of artists go ranging from artists who are here today, doing things that are highly conceptual, but not renouncing the traditions of ceramics or the traditions of printmaking. So I think that was the difference. But the funny thing is, is I feel like now history here has caught up with me. And people are like, could you teach us how to think about these things, not just as a ready-to-use tool, not just paint out of a tube, but what, would, what if you wanted to make your own colors? How would you do that? Well, that was my training. <laughs> I was making my own colors. So that, I think, is a difference. And then the other one is, I don't think that the United States still has a great love of poetry, which I'm sad about because we have some amazing poets. Europe, you have people who can actually recite poems to you entirely from their childhood that they memorize and that they still love. And I still read poetry and I still give books of poetry as gifts. And even though my friends now are stopping looking so surprised, they're still like, oh, thanks. So I think that's one other difference. I think it was much more common texture of the everyday world to be reading poets and to be thinking about poetry. And I think, once again, history's catching up. There's more and more interest, especially in places like Los Angeles and New York, for poetry. There's more readings. There's more of these things happening. But I think that those were differences that then I was, when I first came back to the States, I was walking around with poetry. People were like, what's that? It's a book of poetry. Like, oh. You know, they weren't sure they wanted to ask me to go out and get a beer or not right after that, because they would be worried I might assail them with ideas about poetry. <laughs> yes, Terry. Yeah, you know, I have a question about the, the poets or the poetry that you decide to work with. And I was wondering if what decides if that's going to be a collaboration is the poetry or the poet. I, I've tried over the years to figure that one out myself. All I can say is looking back over my own shoulder and saying what I am by what I've done, I've picked both as a curator and as a person collaborating, I've picked the people, not the work. I generally think that really interesting people will make really interesting work. And it's always been happenstance, having a conversation with someone and says, oh, that looks really interesting. And then they show me a book of what they're writing. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. I met Laura Mullen through a mutual friend in Santa Barbara, and we got to talking. And that's how that book came about. And I hadn't read her writing until we started talking about collaborating. And then I read some of her amazing books, which is experimental, experimental prose, which I'm very interested in. But as a general rule, I have not written a famous poet whose poetry I love and said, oh, I really want to collaborate with you. There, there may be a day that I do that, but for the moment it has really been building a community from the ground up. These are people that I've met, I've been enchanted with them, I've been enchanted with their work, and I've thought this would be a wonderful experience to have to do this together with them. So. Well, thank you very much for, yes? No, no. No, no, please, go ahead. No, I'm just not going to hold you captive. I also okay. have another guy question. Thank you. I feel but, like it. So I'm just interested in your your conceptual process, especially for instance in, in the, this body of work and, and that body of work, in the sense that you have um, a, a very rich symbology um, adjacent to the poetry. Uh, and in here you have several, uh, three or four or more symbols adjacent to the images here. And I, I actually have. Uh, you know, I have no idea how, what the relationship between those symbols and the poetry or the ideas you're trying to express is. So m my question to you is when you decide to, to put these marks or these symbols um, relative to like images, um, is it so that I as a viewer will free associate or is it that I, I wish I had uh, more symbols so I could really know why you picked those? I would say that I would really like the free association part. I love abstraction because it doesn't require a didactic panel to tell you what's going on. It is true that there are stories behind these. The only thing I can say is the trace that I had running through these googies, which were the basis of Verge, was that I was fascinated by that era, the 50s and 60s. So I went fishing in my memory for colors from that era, 
for images from that era, so things that were more from hippies, there was the Sputnik girl, these were things that were from the news, and I embedded those in them, but the free form painting is related more to the notion of a gesture of writing than it is to anything else. So when I set them up, I'm not expecting the viewer to reconduct themselves along my same steps, I'm actually just interested that they would first be fascinated and then come to their own conclusions about it. For example, over on this one, which instead uses specular doubling, which is very common in the visual arts, it was part of a larger project that I called, I don't remember the exact title, but it was about like role models, like how you have them. So here are at the basis, the blue images that are printed, that come from chiaroscuro woodcuts, they're all images of a philosopher, the philosophers from the 1700s, 1800s. So there I was, a late graduate student, I'm like, I'm going to imitate the, the philosophers. How do they stand? What do they do? So I shot, my, actually Robert Wiedemer shot my photographs of me standing against a blue screen, and then I dropped myself in as a way of saying, so how is this philosophizing attitude in my body being echoed? Then I went back and began to work with monograms. Monograms that were both mine and symbols of these gadzook ligatures, because I was interested in the way that letters slide around and become unrecognizable. So those were the, the elements that I threw into the mix. But once again, my hope would be that someone just more finds the enigma pleasing, interesting, and interpretable to their ends, rather than them being conducted to my end. As, as much as I like to think of myself as a relatively articulate speaker and relatively articulate writer, I like being inarticulate when I make things because I think that's a more, it's a more interesting relation for me. When I go to see a show, I go and look at the work. Later, I may read the labels. Later, I may read the artist's interview. But I'm really going to get this impact of something I've never seen before, and I like the surprise of the unknown. I really love encountering something that I've never seen before being, whoa, even not liking it at first, and then coming around to going, wow, that's interesting. And then later, the backstories I think are interesting, but I would not like, as often happens in my opinion, that the story supplants the experience of seeing something entirely other than what we're expecting. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, it's, it's just the way, I mean, it might be a little bit, I don't know, harsh, but it just seems to me that, that, that that's the experience I was looking for. That's how I love to have stretching, walk up and go like, what? And that for me was this really wonderful moment which so much was going on. And yeah, you can read the interpretation, but somehow words can often supplant physical experience. So the guide to the process that be lies behind the work starts, I mean, I, I used to go to the defeats and people, they'd spend all the time reading the label look, and they'd leave. You're like, wow, they didn't even look at the Joto. They just looked at the label. They looked at the label for like three minutes because they're long. And then they're like, glance and they moved. And it's like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I'm going to stare at the Jato. You, you can forget about Jato. You can forget about the label. I don't want the label. So I sometimes don't label, but you know, Michelle, once again, is in this amazing job of having a conversation with me and then putting up these didactic panels so that students who want to maybe use me as a role model the way I use the philosophers can say, oh, what, what, did, what, did, what did John do? What, did, what was John thinking about? Hey, Susan. Um, I'm aware of your work in sculpture, and I know Yeah, I think I think most artists do. One of the things that I, once again, I, I feel like I'm relatively articulate. I'm a fairly clear writer, but I like to be as unarticulate and as ambiguous when I'm thinking about things. So one of the things that I would generally do when I approach making, I don't call it a book to start with. It's this thing that I'm working with. If that thing branches into a more sculpture-like thing or a more closed book-like thing, that comes later on in the process. But it does come up that at one point things sort of veer away, and they veer away from the category that they started from. So you might start first thinking, or I might start thinking, do a scrapbook, and it ends up being a pile that ends up being a sculpture. That happens. And it happens that at one point from a sculpture I start thinking, I'd really like to make something someone could carry away, give themselves, so they can take it as a book. So that's the, the criteria that it falls along. 
But I myself try to approach material that I'm working with without giving it such a specific name that it controls my behavior. I want it to be the opposite way. I want my behavior to be based on what I'm following at that moment and let the categories fall where they may. And then, then it becomes one of those things where people have come up to me who are like, not necessarily cured, but historians are like, was this a book or a sculpture? And I'm like, that's your conundrum. I'm good. I, I'm going to get a coffee. Would you like one? Then I offer I think something in exchange that's not a definition, because that's not the way we work. Well, interesting as you're standing next to... Lydia's piece, yeah. Yes, which, you know, is the shape of a book? Is it a book or is it a sculpture? Those are the lines that can get crossed. And yeah. You know, once, one of the other things, too, is now it's happening also in painting and sculpture, obviously. But when you are in the quite unquote minor arts, you can kind of do anything you want because nobody cares. And so there you are making, you know, books out of sculpture, sculpture into books, and people are like, oh, it's not, and they don't care. It's like, oh, you, you know, painting, that's really serious. It's, or marble sculpture. And I came from Italy where its traditions are pretty strong. So if you were somebody that was just like, wow, John's just being wacky again, which is good. So we had, I had room to do what I wanted to. I repeat that that's, for me, a, a driving force is being able to get in to a vehicle that's material and power it or pilot it where I find something interesting happening. Then I leave it, and then I leave it for the viewer's understanding or misunderstanding, which is fine. I've had some wonderful misunderstandings which have given me an amazing insight to what I thought I was doing as well. Another question? Well, thank you very much for coming out. I appreciate it, Take, raving the tan or whatever. And uh, thank you, Michelle, and thank you all of the people in the gallery for helping. I thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Yeah, I want to just mention my staff who are all student workers. Um, they are architecture, art history, and graphic design students. Um, so I'll mention them. If you see a, somebody with a tag on, say thank you for all their hard work. They've been working all through the break for this, doing the show, doing the graphics, and so on. We have Jed right over here, uh, Bridget uh, over here in the corner. Um, we have Indra, who's over at the other gallery. If you would like to get over there, we're going to keep it open until 5.15, if anybody would like to go over there. Um, we have Antoinette and Katrina. And there's food. And there's food. Really <laughs> there's food. food. Please, please eat. Um, and then there's, did I miss anyone? Jessica, um, as well as here. And then uh, two of my staff that aren't here today are Jasmine and Atene. I think I got everyone. Did I mention everyone? Did I miss anyone? If I did, I'm sorry. Um, so thank, thank you to my staff because they are wonderful and without them I can't do anything around here. Um, so uh, I would just wanted to comment uh, to John, thank you very much for, uh, for sharing you, yourself, with us here. Uh, I think this is very personal and I really appreciate you, thank you. you opening up to us and sure. allowing for this venue to show, uh, to show your work. Thank you, and all of you, thank you for coming. Have a great night. Thank you. She does art, and she also do a lot of weaving, shorts, or blankets. She's very technical professional. That's a very beautiful piece. I think it's looking at It's a lap to get to park and start. That's kind of neat. It's kind of the road fun trail. Yeah, yeah exactly. they, 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 they did. Well, thank you. are welcome. <laughs>